wearing that beautiful suit. <laughs> Thank you, Apostle. <laughs> He's just trying to steal my suit. <laughs> Good afternoon, y'all. Good afternoon. You know, this is the hardest time to teach is right after somebody just finished eating greens. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> And cornbread. and cornbread, so the great news, they had no hot sauce, so <laughs> that might be helpful, but um, as he said, I'm Jay Jones, um, and you can call me whatever you want to call me, actually my wife just called me, hey you, so it, my, uh, my, uh, say, hey you, get over here, my, <laughs> and my granddaughter called me Pops, so I, I go by all kinds of names, so I, I answer to everything, uh, so you just remember Jay. Uh, that, that's good. And that's my telephone number. If you have questions after you hit this, feel free to reach out to me. I've been teaching finance, uh, financial literacy since 1997. So financial literacy before financial literacy became popular. And so uh, to get a background where I get this information from, uh, I've been doing church finance since, what you say, 2006? 2006 time frame. So I've worked with the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to church finance. I've helped build, uh, uh, do financials for church churches. I've helped build uh, facilities, uh, large sanctuaries, child care centers. I, I heard about child care center today. I've helped build uh, a skating rink, a basketball arena, et cetera, for commercial uh, Company, I mean, commercial nonprofits, both in Charlotte, North Carolina, in Texas, and here in Georgia. So I'm just happy to be here. Um, I've worked for three major uh, banking institutions. One, one was called Bank of America. I mean, Bank of America. <laughs> I hope this not being recorded. <laughs> I still have stock with him, so I'd be nice with him. The other, one was, the other one was Synovus Bank, it's based out of Columbus, Georgia, and the last one was, uh, was uh, First Citizens Bank out of Raleigh, North Carolina. But, you know, giving unto God, giving unto the apostle, all the apostles, the ministers, and unto you for be, still being here today. So thank you. And at the front of the room, I, I need to tell you, this is my wonderful wife. This is Tina, all right here. She's, She's the first lady and the administrator of the church, so she tell me when I'm right and she tell me when I'm wrong. I've been married to her for 33 years. And to let you know, when I married her 33 years, old, 33 years ago, I had a full head of hair, like you, <laughs> Apostle. I had a full head of hair. Look at my head now. I'm so bald here, you can smell my brain. So <laughs> that's, that's how bad it is. And this is Minister Tracy Ferris. He's one of our ministers at our church. In fact, he's preaching tomorrow. He's doing his first sermon at the church tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Not, not first sermon, first sermon just at our church. So first sermon, he just came over from McDonough, so we're glad to have him and his wife. His wife is uh, one of our dance team members uh, at the church. But anyway, today we're going to be talking about church finance. I'm going to go real quick, and if you have any questions as I go along the way, some of the stuff you may know and some of you may not know. So if you know it, just kind of shake me off and say, I already know this. Um, real quick, how many of y'all ever heard of a BOIR report? Are you familiar with that? Okay, if you're not, um, I want you to go online. I want you to Google BOIR. If you're a business owner, if you're a nonprofit, you know a business, I need you to go and do that BOIR report. Let me tell you why. It's called a Beneficial owners, Ownership Information Report. Most people don't know about it. And that report has to be complete by December 31st of this year. It's done through FISAN, and if you don't have it done, then you're gonna start getting fined over $500 per day. day. So I need you to go, you can go online and do it. It's very simple to go online. I created some slides about that. If you want me to send it to you, I'll be glad to send it to you after this. That's my email address up there, send me any, uh, Send me an email and say, I want this information on BOIR, and I will, I will email it to you. And then you can just follow the step-by-steps that I already wrote out for you and do that BOI report. Please, it's imperative that you do that. It's imperative if you know anybody that owns a small business that's an LLC or anything like that, have them do that report. So that's the number one thing I want to tell you before we get into this presentation. Okay? 
Everybody with me? Okay, so Apostle Holly told me y'all were brilliant when I, when I was coming here to Cartersville. So I'm going to see how smart y'all really are because it's after lunch. I need to see how smart y'all are. And we're going to do it together. This is a test before I go into what we're going to talk about. This is a test. Spell the word mop. M-O-P, we got to do it together now. How you, how you spell mop? M-O-P. That spells? Mop. Spell the word top. M-O-P. And that spells? Top. Spell the word cop. M-O-P. And that spells? Top. Okay, let's do it together. Let's spell the first word, M-O-P. Mop is spelled? M-O-P. Second word is cop is spelled? M-O-P. Last word is top is spelled? What do you do with a green light? <laughs> Mr. Eric, I know now I know he was in the army. So how many army people we had beside over here? The army, that's three army. He go, you got to stop at a green light? No, you go at a green light. So I need y'all to listen to what I'm talking about. And don't join the army in this. Be all you can be. Do not join the army. Too late, too late. So this is an overview of what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes. I'm going to talk about just 501c3s, uh, nonprofits. Um, I'm going to talk about something called a personal financial statement. Anybody familiar with a PFS? Okay. I know some of you may be. Uh, Don and Bradstreet, uh, DMB. Uh, is everybody here familiar with DMB? And am I singing to the choir? Are y'all familiar with that? Uh, you are. Well, thanks, Doc. Um, nonprofit registration. The reason why I'm going to mention that because um, it's a large percentage of churches that are not registered with the Secretary of State. They think they are, but every year you need to register uh, annually. And I'm going to talk a little bit about financial software merchant service. I'm not trying to sell you anything so you can hear me. I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm not here to influence you to go to one bank or the other. I'm a retired banker. I don't represent any bank. I don't represent any merchant service company. I don't represent any of that. Only person I represent is God and my wife. That's who I represent. Whatever she tell me, I can say. And she's going to have the keys. She'll start shaking when I go in too long. Uh, too long. And the last part is sales tax exemption status. So is there any topic that y'all are more interested in on that topic? So I know which one to spend the longest on. Section three? Okay. I'll tell you more about that when we get there. And that's usually interests a lot of people. Um, Real quick, uh, I don't do anything financial. I talk about the scriptures. Here's some of my favorite scriptures when it comes to financial well-being. Uh, I know someone mentioned uh, earlier about, uh, I think they were talking about a plan, one of the plans about the saving for seven years. Uh, Y'all remember that earlier? The speaker was speaking about that. So... But my God shall provide all your needs according to his riches and glory. And here's the thing. Our people were destroyed for what? A lack of knowledge. A lack of knowledge. And unfortunately, when it comes to the church, oftentimes we have a lack of knowledge. When I go to uh, Houston, Texas, where I grew up, and I go back to Texas and I talk to some of my old uh, church members and what. They don't want to know this stuff that I'm about to talk to you about because they've been doing it this way for so long. They don't want to know this other stuff. So I'm going to teach you some things. Hopefully, it's going to help you. I'm sure we're not that way here, right? Section one, establish a 501c3. If you decide you're going to start a nonprofit in the state of Georgia, you can do three things. One is you can do it yourself which is the cheapest way to do it. Uh, you can hire an attorney. Attorney's going to charge you. Anybody know to start a nonprofit? 1200 to 1600 About $1,200 to $1,600, in some cases, $2,000 to establish a nonprofit. Uh, a CPA is going to charge you almost $1,800. But technically, you could do it for free mm-hmm. if you just follow the procedures that I'm going to show you. Now, here's the biggest question for, for nonprofits, or especially religious organizations, that's the way you designate it as a church. Should you even be one? Well, what'd you say, Doc? 
Doc says yes. Who says no? Somebody here say, why you say no, uh, Apostle? So, but you're essentially, you're saying you still should be a 501c3. Well, you're in the 501c3, and he nailed it. That's exactly right. Churches by law do not have to be, they're already considered tax exempt by the state. But if you decide to do other things, you're going to need a 501c3. Now, here's the thing I want to point out. I want to point this out. This is one of the things I want to point out that most people, they always yell, I'm gonna be a 501c3. Do you know there's 29 types of 501s? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There's 29 types, there's a 501c1, there's a 501c2, there's a 501c3, there's a 501c4. There's a 501c3. There's a 501c4. Yep. Most churches, religious organizations are 501c3s. And the difference is, and go back to what the apostle said, it's true that churches, synagogues, temples, mosques, and other places of worship are not required to file a form 1023. And churches do not have to file a 990. A 990 is your tax returns at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Now, when you do have to file tax returns, if you decide you're gonna have a child care center, that's called unrelated business income. Mm -hmm. If you decide you're gonna have a school, if you decide you're gonna have something after school programs, things like that, that's unrelated business income, what they call UBIT, that's what accountants call UBIT. That's the short words they, they use. But if you decide to do that, then you would need um, to worry about your 990. A 990 is just like your, your, your 1040, that you, your W-2s that you get at the end of the year. So if you don't know what that is, those of you who file taxes. Do everybody here file taxes? <laughs> I don't pay taxes no more, so I don't know what that is. <laughs> I'm retired military. <laughs> I let Tina pay all the taxes, y'all. So here's the advantage. I want to put the advantages and the disadvantages of becoming a tax exempt status. Here's where the advantage come in. So Brother Jones has been given to the church for over 10 years. And Brother Jones claimed that on his tax returns. And then what happened is Brother Jones get audited. Have anybody ever here ever been audited other than me? How many times? Just one. How many times have we been audited? You said one time. How'd you, how many times have we been audited? We were audited three times. One too many. And let me tell you the three times, and one too many, and three times, and the time we were audited, guess who we were, guess who were doing our taxes? <laughs> who were doing our taxes, Tina? Uh, XRS. Uh, that's one. A what? XRS. They said there was an ex-IRS tax agent. I never deal with anybody ex-IRS. <laughs> never, ever, ever. When I started doing my taxes myself, then I never got audited again. But we got, we got audited three times as a result of dealing with somebody who's an ex. So go back to the person that was donated for 10 years. So they get audited. And the first thing the auditors ask for is show me pew. Proof that you were donating to a nonprofit, a 501c3. If you just donate to a nonprofit and they weren't a 501c3, they exclude all those donations. Did y'all know that? Yeah. You knew that, right, Doc? So that's the danger of not being a 501c3. That's the danger of not. No, it's not invalid. I said if they get audited. Now, the likelihood of they getting audited is like less than, less than 2%. I don't want you to get scared and say, oh, because you're still a nonprofit in the state. You're considered a nonprofit in the state. But they could exclude it. They could. If, they really, if you get the wrong agent, they could. They don't have to. In our cases, we, we had given to several nonprofits. So you can give to Goodwill. Uh, to Samaritan Purse, you, those are all 501s, so you can give to them, you can give to the church. But now, because they changed the exemption, it's not gonna matter that much anyway. But I just wanna give you that as an example. So, uh, that's your, non, your formal structure, your limited liability, 
you're, you're limited from liability as a church when you have a 501c3. There's certain things that people can't sue you for when you're a 501c3. So that's your advantages uh, to be in, and you're eligible for other grants and other public and private grants. Mm -hmm. These are your advantages to being a 501c3. Your disadvantage is it costs money to create one. I told you you can do it yourself, but uh, sometimes you don't know how to do it. If you're not a, uh, my master's degree is in public, public administration, so I learned about nonprofit, so that's why I had to learn that in school, so I know how to do that stuff, and so that's how I learned how to do it. Um, by, um, uh, it was just part of my education uh, process. Um, share control, scrutiny by the public, some people don't like it because once you become a 501c3, guess what? You have to open your books up to the public. It, and you should be opening your books up anyway. anyway. <laughs> so, so your books should, should not be a, a secret to your congregation. They should be able to say, hey, I would like to see the books. Uh, okay, here it is. Here's, here's our financial statement. So this is what it looks like. And earlier, Apostle says there's a difference between a nonprofit and a tax exempt status. Non nonprofit status is a state law concept. Nonprofit status to make an organization eligible for certain benefits. How does an organization become tax exempt? Is you apply for that 501c3. It costs $600 in the state of Georgia to apply for a 501c3. That's what it costs. How do I attain one? Here's the funny thing that I get most often this thing at the bottom. I get this question most often. People come to me and says, I'm just doing the 1023EZ, which is one page. Guess what? That don't apply to churches. They cannot, if you have a CPA attorney or someone tell you they can fill out EZ, the devil is a lie, they cannot. They have to fill out a 1023 loan form. And it's not hard to do. It's so easy because a lot of those pages that's on that 1023, you would never fill out anyway. So I just want to point it out. So you have to have a form 1023, not a 1023 easy. Things you need to know. The two most important things you need to know about 1023, a nonprofit, is what is called bylaws and income tax requirement. That you don't have to report your income tax. And you have to have these, you have to have these two statements in your bylaws. You have to have a purpose statement, and you have to have a nonprofit status and liquidation. Now, where well, churches get in trouble a lot of times when they apply for 501c3, y'all know what is the number one thing they get in trouble for? They get denied for? Discriminatory comments. Discriminatory practice. And they bylaws. And then I go meet through a church. I just met with 38 churches down in North Carolina. And I go meet them and says, and our bylaws, we got to have no gays allowed. You just mess yourself up. Discriminatory practice. No blacks allowed. No this. No this. We're not going to have these people that look like this in our church. And they want to make sure it's in their bylaws. Mm -hmm. And I tell them and say, hey, you write your bylaws with the right dissolution clause. You write your nonprofit status and your liquidation. You put that in there. You get rid of any discriminatory practice in your bylaws. And then what you, you could always change your bylaws. After you get approved, <laughs> get approved, then go back and change your bylaws. Amend the bylaws. It, amend the bylaws if that's what you do. You can amend it after you get your file. So get, do what the federal government wants you to do, and then you go and amend your bylaws. People amend it all day long, all, every day. Question. Yes, ma'am. Couldn't you just put the scripture there and not spell the scripture? You can. Because that would be preventing They're They'll never read the scripture. That's a great question. Yeah. It'll be a part of your bylaws. You can just put the scripture there. You can. <laughs> That's that doctorate degree is kicking in. Like, I ain't got to do all that. We ain't got to do all that. So again, income tax requirement, you do not have to file income tax as a church. That's the other blessing by being a nonprofit religious organization. Uh, you do have to file. You have all these things that Apostle Holly has here. He has a coffee shop. He has to file taxes on <laughs> He has books. He has to file taxes on uh, uh, So 
Remember that thing I told you about, called UBIT? I see it at the bottom? <laughs> Known as UPI, UBIT. If a nonprofit earns over a thousand a year from a trade or business that's unrelated to the business, that's called unrelated business income, they have to file taxes on that. Child care, after school programs, et cetera. So I just want you to know that. This is the application that you would use. Call it 1023. And if you have questions about that application, guess who? You can contact a CPA, you can contact an attorney, or you can just call me. I'll be glad to answer any question. This is the form that you get from the federal government after you get approved for 501c3. This is what it looks like. This is our church, 501c3. You see I highlight it. It has an EIN number, custom service number. It says, we are pleased to inform you've been accepted. Once you accept it, you have to do some really crazy stuff to get that. Revoke. They don't just revoke it for nothing. But one of the crazy things to get you revoked is when you don't do your Secretary of State um, every, and you can do that for one year, Secretary of State, you can do it for one year, you can do it for three years. We do ours for three years. It's time for us to be renewed. It's, uh, it's $50 a year for most churches, $50 a year to renew your Secretary of State identification. We forget, folks, we forget, we forget what our own business. We forget to do it. We forget with the church, we forget to do it. I do it with my son's business, with her business, with the church, make sure those are filed. That can get you revoked. So make sure you do it. How many have you renewed your Secretary of State or getting ready to renew it? And know it had to be do it, done every year. So I go to some churches in Cedar Town and in Rome and I talk to them. They not, they've been revoked. So what kind of questions do you have about that? Any questions about 501c3s? How many 501c's are there? Twenty-nine. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. You had a question? Okay. This next thing is most people don't know what it is because they never had to do it. This next thing is most people don't know what it is because they never had to do it. So if Apostle decided he wanted to get a loan on his church, one of the first thing the bank is going to ask him for is this thing called a personal financial statement. Um, this is what it looks like. It's called a PFS. Everyone in this room should have a PFS, regardless of for the church or for you personally. You need to have a PFS. A PV PFS provides your personal information. It tracks your financial goals. It talks about your assets and your liabilities and your net worth. This is what this does. You can pull it up online, just Google personal financial statement. Everyone should, if you own a small business, if you a nonprofit, if you're a church, the pastor should always have a PFS. And why would you have a PFS? Why would, this, why would the bank want a PFS from the pastor of the church? Why would they want that? What's that? Yeah, they want to know how he's managing, or she, he or she are managing money because some pastors don't know how to manage money. Did you say amen, Doc? I sure did. <laughs> <laughs> it was good stuff. So, but also the other reason, because the bank always want a personal guarant guarantor, mm -hmm. and they want to know if that personal guarantor is a good steward of their money. Amen. Because they're not a good steward of their own money, mm -hmm. they ain't going to be a good steward of the mm -hmm. church money. And the PFS also helps them pull another thing called a personal credit report. Do everybody here know what their credit score is? Yeah. Or do y'all check? Do you know what, what is the name, main credit score you should have? Everybody know? Uh -huh. You're not going to Credit Karma. No. Why, why do you want to go to Credit Karma? They, have a of their credit score. they use this system called Advantage. I'm going to tell you what it's called. It's called Advantage. That's what you use. Sometimes they use Next Gen, sometimes they use Advantage. The only one that counts is FICO. I'm going to tell you what my credit score is right now, right in front of you. My credit score is 832. Yeah. But let me tell you what my wife's credit score is. Hers is 844. Ooh. Why is the woman credit score always higher than the man? I think it's sexist, if right. possible. <laughs> <laughs> what did you call it? What did you say? I love it. She got it. She nailed it. 
That's what most people mess up with, with credit card utilization or credit limit utilization. What should your credit card utilization be? Not that low. Who just hit it? Apostle. It's 30 percent. The answer is 30 percent. So I talk to a lot of young people who I get them to do personal financial statements. They go in, they get ready to go to college and get their first credit card. And the first thing they do is they walk in the mall. They walk in the mall. I call it my youngest son, who's a football player. When he first got his first credit card, I say he was doing his pretty boy walk through Town Lake <laughs> Mall. He's like, look at me. Look how pretty I am. I'm a football player. Look at me. And you know, at Christmas time, you know what happens? They set out those things in the they send out those things, and the young ladies be sitting there, and they, they get them to fill out applications. So he fill out a Velc app. He fill out a Velc application. The girl gave him the application. He filled out. He got approved right on the spot for a thousand dollars. And he called me and said, "Dad, I know I've been to your credit class, but guess what? I got approved for a Velc's card. <laughs> what do I do?" I said, "You got to keep it, son." He said, Dad, you mean I don't do the climate? No, you have to keep it because it's going to bring down your credit score if you don't. What should I do? So he, I said, call your mama. And, of course, you know, she's going to break him down, his little ego from being pretty. She's going to break him down. <laughs> Why did you do that application? So what we did, we, we let him charge $300 or 30% on that car. So he charged $300. Now, here's the thing. He was a football player. So how much money was he making in college as a football player? <laughs> but Belks approved him for $1,000. So he got a $300 credit card. I mean, three, he charged $300. We paid it off. So we let him do it again, charged $300. And guess what happened after the third month? His credit score went up to 845 So what do you think happened after his credit score went to 845 What do you think Belks did? They increase the limit to five thousand dollars. <laughs> Dad, do I need to go charge thirty percent? No, boy. <laughs> you don't have a job. You don't have a job. So, so that's how credits is doing. And now they even slicker. What they do is now. So we have a Home Depot credit card, right? Because she do interior design. It's a fifteen thousand dollar limit. And so they get mad when you don't use the card. If you don't use the card, you know what they'll do. They'll shut it down. So you know what we do? I go in, I go buy a piece of candy on the card, and then I pay it off. As long as you charge something, they can't close it down. So just be aware of that. But PFS, I need everybody to make sure you Google that, look up a personal financial statement, and start filling one out. It's going to help you with budgeting, too. So you need to have one on file anyway for you personally. Um, so make sure you get this done. Dunn's number, that was the one you told me you was interested in. Yeah. <laughs> Remember www.dmb.com. Dunn's number is your Equifax experience and transunion for small business. It's going to break down like that. That's what it is. Um, that's your annual credit report.com for, for personal credit. So this is what Dunn's number is, called DMB in short. We call it the DMB. It's a data universal numbering system. That's what it is. It's linked to your company's business credit. That's what it does. Did y'all know your company, your church has a business credit? Yes. You did? Do you know what your business credit score is? Nope. You don't, you don't have any idea? I think about it. I haven't been in Anybody know what their business credit score is? I was is 94. Oh, that's so, well, what's the highest score can it be in the DMB? Anybody know what the highest score can be? Because your personal credit, what's the highest score you can have? 850. And I told you hers is higher than mine, which I hate. I'm, I still got to keep you. But the highest DMB score is 100. It's 100. So I just want to let you know it. But it's, go ahead. You're fine. You're not interrupting me. I want you to ask questions. No. First, uh, DMB, they used to have First Research, a company called First Research, but they were trying to get rid of DMB and trying to move on to something else, but they haven't figured it out yet. It's sort of like when they were trying to get rid of FAIR, they were trying to get rid of FICO. That's why Next Gen and, and uh, Next Gen and the other one came out. They were trying to get rid of FICO, and they couldn't get rid of it. Same thing with this. That's a great question. 
but DMB is going to be around. It's different. DMB is similar to the EIN number. Y'all know what EIN number is? Yes. Now, here's the thing I want to remind you guys. If you want you apply for EIN numbers, you're going to start getting letters in the mail from people that's not even related to the IRS. You're going to get letters from, the, from people that's not even related to the Secretary of State telling them you got to pay this and you got to pay this. Make sure you look that letter closely. More than likely, it's fraud. More than likely, it's trying to collect money from you. They would send you a thing and have a, it was say on the top, Georgia Secretary of State, a look official, and at the bottom it said, you owe us $350. Make sure you're going to get that every time you apply for an EIN or a DUNS number. You're going to get those fake letters. So if you get a letter, you don't know what it is, just photo, you know, send, send me a picture of it. I can tell you if it's fake right away. It's probably fake. Because if you did it online already, you're not going to get a letter from, uh, from the state, uh, and you're not getting a letter from the IRS. So, but they use what they call sick numbers and things like that. And where would this come in a place for a church? Why would you need a done something for a church? Uh, funding, go ahead. Funding, what else? What did you say, Apostle? You want to get a loan? Uh, so, it was at one point in our time, we had to get a church piano. And we, uh, we didn't want to take the money out of the checking account to get the church piano. So we went to Atlanta. We found this piano that could change all these different tunes. We got a, the first thing they did was they ran out business credit. And here was the blessings that we, we applied for it, got approved for the credit. We bought the piano. And before we can get back to the church, somebody already paid the piano off. That's how God has worked for us at our church. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Uh, so our church is going to have a CD now, a small brand CD, but the last couple of major purchases we made, I had to co-sign for the church. What would cause that? You had to be a guarantor. Yeah. So I would have to look at the Dunn's number to see what's going on with it. Because typically... We could pull your DMB in and I can take a look at it to see what exactly what is going on. Uh, DMB, just like a regular credit report, you can pull it and you can see where the flaws are. So unless it's more than $50,000, you should never have to co-sign. If it's less than $50,000 without collateral, you shouldn't have to co-sign for anything less than $50,000. Yes, ma'am. No. Only when you're using it, you increase it. Now, just like, uh, I will tell you this, that just like your personal credit score, when you go past that 30% percent limitation, it also happens with churches. So if you bought something for 5000 and you finance it for 5000 guess what? It's going to decrease your credit score. Because of the utilization. The utilization score, that percentage can bring down your credit score. It can do it sometimes. I paid off my house, and somebody told me that's the worst thing I could have did. Well, let me, let me tell you why they tell you the worst thing you could ever do. That's for two reasons. One is because of taxes, because you lose your tax benefit when you pay off it. I get to go talk to large and small churches, and the thing that really drives me crazy when a church says, I need to let you know I was pushing my membership to pay this church out so we can burn our Mortgage. Why? Why are you stressing your people out like that? They stress out already at home. So you're going to stress them out about so you can have a show so you can burn your mortgage? Why? I want to get the longest mortgage as possible with the less principal and interest payments I can. <laughs> Think about it. Most of us have 30 year mortgages, right? Are you going to still be alive in 30 years? Let me shut up. How many of y'all got 30 year mortgage? How many of y'all got how many of y'all got 30 year mortgage beside me? Am I the only one? Are you gonna be alive in 30 years? You don't know. What does it matter that you 
paid it off in 30 years. What does it matter? Now, here's the other thing. All real estate get equity. It, it appreciates. So if something happened to me and her today, my son's got over a million dollars in equity in two houses. Here's the thing that I told them, and she know I told them this just recently. I said, I need to let y'all know, ain't gonna be no cash in the accounts. Y'all could burn me, I don't care what y'all do, because there ain't gonna be no cash in the account. Because me and her going on vacation, we live in the La Vida Loca. We having a good time on all our money. So, but you're gonna have the equity in the house, you can go sell a house, you can live in the house, you can do whatever you want, but the cash, we having fun. We are not saving for you, we saving for us. I know some of y'all go like, oh, I need to save for my kids. I ain't saving for my kids. One is 31, he live about three miles down there, so the other 27, and I already told him, you're gonna go to the checking account, we, it's gonna be broke, it's gonna be zero balance. We having fun. We and our, we having fun life. Now here's the thing, we walk in God's promises, we both do. I retired at, I'm 65, so y'all know I'm 65 years old. I retired at 55. Walked away from a 200000 a year job. She retired at 45. Wow. She's 50, how old are you now? I, I don't want to say how old are you are. 56. Oh, she's 56. You're going to say it. We were making, we were making 400000 a year when we walked away from our job. We walked away from a job, and she's like, boy, are you crazy? We live in 400000 a year to walk away. And guess how many we were making when we walked away? Zero. And guess how much money we get from the, the church? And guess what kind of house we live in? Because now when people see us in our house, they see the cars we drive, and they, they don't know those, those cars are old. They just, they just stay clean. And the cars are paid for. The house is almost paid for. And they say, how do you do that? And they're like, oh, the pastor taking money from the church. You don't know what I had to do to get where I'm at. <laughs> it's not getting that two dollars. That two dollars ain't. That two dollars ain't getting. It. But God has blessed us exceedingly and abundantly of what we ask for. I think He continued to bless us over and over again. He bless us. He bless us through our sons. I have one son that's 27 years old. He's an influencer. He has over nine million followers. He's doing his thing. He's doing really. He's doing really well. And I told her I didn't self actualize to Christmas time. It was over Christmas. I've self self actualized. Y'all know what self actualization is? Y'all heard of Maslow's hierarchy theory? Yeah. Well, you got your self esteem needs, self actualization, the highest you could be. Uh, we were sitting at a restaurant on Barry Parkway. It was eight of us, and we were eating at Christmas time. And after Bill come, I always pull out my check, my my American Express card. Never leave home without it. Because she's going to pay the bill. So I pull out my American Express card to pay it. And my 27-year-old walked over and says, Dad, I got this. Y'all know what I started doing at the table? I started crying at the table. <laughs> when my 27-year-old now tell me, and my 31-year-old yeah, say, I got this now, Dad, I could cry now because I know I did what I was supposed to do as a dad. They're boys. They're boys. <laughs> Amen. They're boys. <laughs> but back to this. I'm sorry. I had to tell you all that story. But EIN and NINE, they're the same as a, as a DUN number. You got EIN for, from the federal government. DUNS is the one you apply for for your credit. EIN num e number is the number that IRS issue. The DUNS number is the one for your credit. So if you don't have, who don't have a DUNS in here that has a small business? Everybody has a DUNS number? You're going to get one? You know how to apply for it? Okay, when you, when you go to www.dmv.com, be careful, as you were stating earlier, what I want you to be careful of, when you go to the first page, it's going to say, it costs you 200 and some dollars to apply for it. It's free. If you go to the bottom of that page, the same page, that says, they'll say, now let me show you how to apply for the free one. <laughs> That's the one you want to apply for. Do not register for, do not pay any monthly fees. You don't have to pay for your DMB. DMB is free. Just like your EIN. If you apply for an EIN number, if you Google EIN number, that's going to be like eight different sites going to come up. 
They say we're going to charge you $89 and $99 for EIN. EIN numbers and DMB is free. Hear that foot stomping. They're both free. Yes, sir. Uh, technically, by law, you do not, you should never get an EIN number automatically. Because they're two separate things. One is by the state and one is by the federal government. So they don't talk to each other. So you would, you would apply for your Secretary of State and then you go in and apply for your EIN through the IRS. And No, there's some people that's creating fake numbers, uh, what is called C, it's a C, it begins with a C, I can't remember what it is. It's people trying to circumvent the system, they're creating some fake numbers and then sending those out. Just like those fake letters that are being sent out. But there's two separate things, just to let you know. I had never heard of that. Dr. Kim, you ever heard of that? No. No? Anybody? Y'all yeah, haven't heard of that? Okay. I haven't either. I'm sorry. I investigated. I'll take a look into it. I'm, but anyway. It's important to establish a, a DMB if you want to have business credit. It's better, now I'm going to tell you why I have business credit. It is better to use somebody else's money than your money. I could take the church money and invest it and earn an interest, compound interest on that. Or I can use a 0% same as, she's a 0% expert. 0% same as cash, 24 months. 0% same as cash. Now, I want you to remember, be careful of all 0% same as cash, because they'll set you up. I'm doing personal in, the, in this business side, so let me give you an example. You go to Rooms to Go at Christmas time. They have 0% same as cash, 24 months. So you go in, they give you a $10,000 limit, and you go in, you buy some furniture for $8,000. So they send you one bill for $8,000, 0% same as cash, 24 months. And then your wife decided, or your husband decided, I need some kitchen furniture. So you go in and apply again. You go in again, they say, oh, you got $2,000 left. So what they do is they create you two different bills. So while you're paying, you're paying on the $2,000 and not the $8,000. Right. So in the meantime, when the 24 months kick in, they're going to double their interest on you. And they do their, not only rooms to go, I'm just giving rooms to go as an example. A lot of furniture stores do that. A lot of financial companies do that. Um, she had to catch them several times, right? Trying to do that, and they'll, they'll do that. So they do that, all kinds of stuff. They do it with churches, especially. One of the things they do with churches, so you know, with religious organizations, when you go into finance and you say, hey, I want the max they usually go on churches on uh, loans is 20 years. That's typically the max. Amortization is 20 years. But what they do is they convince you, apostle, I can get you a lower payment if you just do interest only for a year. And because the payments are low, guess what he says? I think it's a great idea. Instead of paying 1,000, I'm gonna pay 500. And every year, guess what happens at the end of that year? You gotta pay 1% of the value of that loan. You write in the bank 1%. They've been doing that forever. So they rip you off by making you pay that 1% every year. 1% of the value of the loan. So what happens if you have a $500,000 loan? What's 1% of 500000 Anybody know? 1% of 500000 1% is 5000 5000 10% would be 50000 So 5000 But every year, $5,000, if you had to pay 5000 every year, you could use that to pay the principal down. But they convince you that the bank has convinced you that it's okay to pay that interest only, and you're like, oh, this is great. That is, that's the greatest banker in, ever, in, in all the world. And guess what he's doing at Christmas time? He or she, they they getting that money as a commission, put it in their pocket, and they go and party for Christmas. They thank you so much. So be careful of interest-only loans. And they not, go ahead and amortize it as long as you can. And then if you want to make extra principal pay payments, if the church bless you, you can make those things. Uh, your parishioners bless you, then you can make the extra principal payments and pay it off early. You can always pay something off early if you like. 
So here were the scores I talked about early. If you have 100, it's the best. We're not the best. We're good, we're just not the best. Zero to 49 means you're high risk. They're not gonna give you that money for that piano. They're not gonna give you that money for the drum sets. 80 to 100 means you're low risk. You said you were 92? 90, 90 something, you're in the 90s, so that's good. If you ever go to a bank, those of you who decide you're gonna go to a bank, and uh, I know Apostle uh, Holly, he's very familiar with this, you go to a bank, one of the first things they're gonna tell you is fill out one of these things. This is the other thing you need if you're a nonprofit. You need what is called a religious organization questionnaire. You need to fill it out. Go ahead, and you need to do one every year, update it, complete it. Uh, this is where you have, and you can just Google it if you want to. There's different ones that have come up. Every bank has them, every financial institution has religious organization questionnaires. It's gonna ask you questions like, who's your architect? Who's your contractor? What is the cost if you're building something? It's gonna ask you who's the head clergy. They wanna know how long that clergy's been there. If you've been there for one year, I'm gonna tell you, <laughs> it's gonna be a no-go. You gotta be at an organization for at least two years. Uh, you gotta be the pastor for at least two years. Uh, length of time they've been with their organization, they wanna know what the denomination is. Why do they wanna know what the nom denomination is? If you know the denomination, does that mean you can't get along? Because it's a longevity. Longevity, and how long? Give you an example, Presbyterian is set up based on what? Anybody know what their setup is based on? It's based on, the, well, they're based on the um, setup of the Congress of the United States. So they know that Presby is set up the same way the Congress is set up. They have a Congress, Presbyterian has a Congress, they have a Senate. Non-denomination don't have that. So they try to look at how the organization's set up. So they look at that. They also ask you questions about, you ever see you walk into the church, you have the person do like click, 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 click. click. That's how you know a church is going to get a loan. They're sitting at the door, they, count, they have the counter, and the usher has the counter. And they're coming down the road, they're going like, they're coming down the aisle, they're going click, 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 click. Apostle Holland count five. Click, 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 click. <laughs> click, click, click. That's what they're doing. They're counting how many members uh, are attending different services. So that's what they're doing. And then they want to know how many youth you have. Why do you want to know how many kids you have? So you have 500 members, they want to know how many youth you have. Why do you want to do that? So they don't see how numbers. They don't have to look at the numbers. They just want to see how much money versus how much not. So if you've got 500 members and, and 400 of them are under 18, they don't know what their money is. Say that again, Doc. So you're saying young people don't donate? Well, the funny thing, we're, our church is probably less than three miles from Kennesaw State University. Oh, wow. So one of the biggest things our members wanted to do, we want to recruit at Kennesaw State. And I went to her and said, you know that's a call center. What do you mean? That's an expense. If that's an expense you want to take over and understand it's an expense, it's not a way you're going to get revenue for the church. If it's the, your mission, you want to do it, yes. But if you're saying you're going there to get money, the answer is no. Kids are broke. <laughs> now, here's the amazing thing that always happened to us. But we have taught our kids how to give. We have a young man as a member of our church in Germany. He's nine years old. He tied to our church every week. Amen. He's nine years old. He figured out a way. What did he, he tied last week, right? Mm -hmm. He tied every week from Germany. He's, his parents are in the military, he tied every week. So I'm not against his tithe, I'm just telling you if you're doing that as a money, saying that's a money maker, that's not, that's not the way you make money. But it is a way you, you build saints, you build disciples, discipleship. So that's your love you're giving back. So, but don't go into it like, I gotta go make some money. Ain't gonna happen. Yeah. Doc said it, ain't no money, it's a cost. But anyway, you have to fill this out. And that's why they do that. Because they're going to subtract the number 18, under 18. They're going to subtract all that from your numbers. So if you have 500 members and you have 100 youth, they're going to say you have 400 members. 
You, they call it giving units. That's how many. Wow. What's that? And that's even less. So here's a, here's a true. I'm gonna give y'all a true reality of a church, so you can know, and what banks know. If I have a hundred people, I'm gonna hate to tell y'all this right now. If I have a hundred pe people sitting in this chair right here, how many are tithers? How many first lady? <laughs> you at thirty percent. You really good. Thirty percent. How many apostles? Less than 20%. And that's the true reality. Mm -hmm. Typically, you got 100 people. If we know that in the church, you don't think they know that at the bank? <laughs> say, say that again, <laughs> Tina. <laughs> Only 2%. What's a true tither? <laughs> uh, Dr. Kim want a true definition, uh, Lady Tina. Go ahead. Tell us the true definition of a true title. Mm -hmm. So here's a problem you have. If, if you go out and pay the, the Georgia State Lotto and you win a million dollars, are you giving 10% to the church? What happened, Dr. Kim? <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> they remind me of a guy who, who went to the church. He kept going to the pastor. He kept going to the pastor. Pastor, I need to win the lotto. I need to win the lotto. I, I, I just can't win the lotto. I'm praying, pastor. I need to win the lotto. And then the pastor said, you got to go play. <laughs> you got to play. That's the one you're going to win. You got to play. But they never going to give their 10%. That's never going to. I've never seen it happen. Now, I have seen people who get a million dollars. I got, she know I get a phone call one day of a person who won a million dollars about 30 days ago. I get the phone call from his brother. I need your help. I know you're a financial guru. I need your help. I said, what you need my help for? My brother won a million dollars 30 days ago. I said, oh, where is that? He broke. In 30 days, he was broke. Huh? He won a million. So, so what, do you think he, what do you think he did? What do you think the first thing he did? First thing he did was he bought a house. He did buy a house. Now, the second thing he bought was a car. What do you think he bought? Cadillac. He bought a Bentley. Oh, a a used. He bought a used Bentley. Okay. But, he, but he paid two hundred fifty thousand for the, the Bentley. So he bought a house, bought a Bentley. Then he bought the furniture. Then the next thing he did was he took his wife to uh, what's that place where the things on the water? The Mal Maldives. Went to the Maldives. So he spent a trip. So here's the next thing he did. So he took his wife to the wife and kids to the Maldives. Then the next thing he did was he took his girlfriend to the. Oh, he took his girlfriend to Europe. <laughs> then I tell you, he had a wife and kids. That's what we heard. Okay, you heard that part. <laughs> and the one thing he didn't account for was Uncle Sam. Because what's a, what's when you get in a tax bracket? If you have a million dollars, what tax bracket do you go in? So, without owning a business, you had 30%, over 30%. Uh -huh. So, 30% of a million is how much? 300,000. So, he was broke within 30 days. That's how it can happen. That's why I teach money management. That's why we talk and about this. And the belly broke down. And <laughs> <laughs> the belly broke down. Can't, you can't afford to change the brakes. <laughs> so, that's what happened. So documents required for a loan approval process. If any of you ever decide you're going to file a file for a loan, these are the documents that they will tell you you need. These are what they call conditions. Would the bank ever call you and says, if you apply for a house, they say, we got some conditions. These are called conditions. We need your formation, your articles of incorporation, 
We need your 501c3. We need your, uh, your budget, your financial statements. Uh, we need your pledge receipts. That's the people that actually give. That 2% that Lady Tina's are talking about. We need your articles and bylaws. They want to make sure there's no discriminatory language in your bylaws. That's the time you get in trouble again because the bank's not going to give you money to discriminate. They, they're backed by the federal government. So your missions report, your lay leader structure, and you see how at the bottom what they request? Personal financial statement. Personal financial statement. These are things you need. If you ever decide you're going to apply for it. Does that make sense? What, what is a lay leader structure? Uh, lay leaders, uh, they just want to know who's a pastor, who's a youth pastor, who's, a, who's the, who's the uh, you know, a lot of churches now have pastors over everything. They do. They don't. That's correct. How do you have a preserved way to get that going to the child for it? That's just like the land. That's voluntary. Okay. They don't have to report. Some would never do it. Some do. I know piano companies do because they report it as soon as we did it. Even though it was paid off by the time we got by the time we got to the church, it was paid off. So, but they reported it already. It was already on the on the report. So some do and some don't. This the other, the other one I want to give you, nonprofit registration. We have to register. We have to stay compliant. Here's the problem. Over 60% of churches and religious organizations in the state of Georgia have either been revoked, administrative dissolved, or closed due to noncompliance. Noncompliance means you didn't pay your $50 at the end of the year. Because we forget. So now, ours is due 2024. That's our third year. I can't pay for it right now. I can't pay for it until January. Right. You, have, you have three months, I think, to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And then you can pay for it. Then I do it for another three years. Yes, ma'am. So, um, this is a question. Do business go from to non-compliant and non-profit? Can you buy a non-profit the way you can buy, like, a business so you have two jobs? When you say buy, you tell me about a name? Or what are you saying? Okay, what equity? I'm, I'm confused so about what. That makes me think in the, the longevity. So if my name, my, my, uh, I'm, I know exactly and know that you can put, I, what, if I'm ABC ministry, whatever, and she wants to be ABC ministry and I end up going out to dissolve, can she immediately pick that name up and keep the equity or the longevity of it? Cause then I'm oh, the years. The yeah. Uh, the answer is no. Uh -huh. The answer is no. No, the answer is no. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, go, go ahead and say what you're going to say. No, go ahead. Say what you're going to say. No, you got to say it. Because most nonprofit, especially if they're 501 c 3 they have to have a letter of resolution in their bylaws. And, and most of them, you have to either uh, give uh, to another nonprofit or, or sell to another nonprofit or whatever like that before you choose to dissolve. So you can't say nothing to anybody to get that attention. But if you take their name, they're not going to give it to you anyway, because they're already mad. <laughs> <laughs> like, I ain't giving her my name. I'm sorry, I'm not giving it to you. This is the site you're going to go to with this guy's pretty picture on there. That's his Secretary of State. You're going to go to that, just select right there, go to that way it says business. You're going to select that right there. And then you're going to go to the corporate division. You do know you can search any business name. You can search any nonprofit just by nonprofit in the IRS. You can pull up, uh, you can pull up any church and see if they're a nonprofit. If they're a five hundred one c three, you can pull up their five hundred one c three information has their EIN number on it. You can create your domestic entity. You don't have to pay anybody to do this. Now, here's the thing I'm gonna tell y'all. Everybody in here for tax purposes to own a small business. I need you to think. If you you, you do music. You need to own a music company, a LLC. Why do I want you to do that? Now, I know it's been recorded. And I'm going to let y'all know who I am. I'm going to let y'all know up front. I am a diehard Kamala fan. 
I'm diehard. I even have a Kamala hat in the car. I'm not, I'm not telling you who to vote for. I'm just telling you who I am. I love Kamala. Um, and now the one thing that Trump did right, y'all, y'all, I don't even like Trump, so I'm gonna let you know I don't like him. I'm gonna tell you the one thing he did right. He filed on his businesses. He filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy. What happens when you file Chapter 11 bankruptcy? Anybody know? So I want you to think about it. They teach us as people how to file Chapter 7, Chapter 13. One is liquidation, one is reorganization. But guess what? He now here's a, I want you to think about it. If that's a Chapter 7 and that's a Chapter 13 and that's a Chapter 11, what does that tell you about the book? That's a book, right? So that's a chapter one, that's a chapter two, that's a chapter three, that's a chapter four. So there's other chapters in that book. So we're talking about chapter 11. Chapter 11 allows you to keep your own assets. So here's what happened. Here's what he did. He bought this stuff, and then he switched over to his business name, and then he filed bankruptcy. And the business failed, but he got to keep all his assets. That's how he did it. That was pretty brilliant, right? I'm not telling you it was right. I'm just telling you it was pretty brilliant. So that's what he did. Oh, it's legal. It was legal. So I'm telling you the one thing I know he did right. I don't think he did it. I think somebody did it for him. Because I don't think he was smart enough. But anyway, that's another conversation. That's a conversation for another day. My wife told me I can't be political. I'm sorry. I can't be political. I'm sorry. Now, here's the funny thing about it. I would tell you, it's, it's, here's the funny thing about it. And I tell you, is I've been a reg- registered Republican since I was 17, since I was 18, when I turned 18, when I went in the military. But guess who I'm voting for this year? Kamala. I'm telling you who I'm voting for. I'm letting y'all know. That's why I'm, I'm not telling you who to vote for. I'm just telling you who I'm voting for. I'm telling you who I'm supporting. Yeah. I have a question yes, about ma'am. that and not really going with the political party because I don't care for either one of them. And my name is Kim and I'm. Go ahead, Dr. Kim. I'm voting for you, Dr. I'm voting for you, Dr. Kim. I'm voting for you. I'm voting for you. So when 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 that particular party was in office, I noticed that my taxes were a lot lower lower than than this present regime. Why is that? Well, let me let me tell you. I'm gonna tell you the why. Since you want to, I'm not gonna get into political aspects. And I looked at my books, so I'm not guessing. I know exactly what it looks like. I'm not gonna. I'm going to tell you the reason like this. Mm-hmm. So when the other regime was in office, other again, regime. other regime, I'm going to use the other regime so we won't, we won't be bashing anybody. What happened was there was a law passed that if, if you were in this certain tax bracket mm-hmm. until 2026, maybe it's 27, I have to look it up. Maybe two, anybody know what year it was? Tw- your taxes would go up every year. But if you were in Tina's tax bracket, guess what happens? Her taxes go down. So if you're in her tax bracket, it goes down. But if you're in your tax bracket, it goes up every year for the next four years. When? That was a law pass. When? During the other regime. During the other regime. When the other regime? I couldn't get it. See, I was trying not to say the name. When Trump was in office, my taxes were lower. No, no. No, 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 no. No, no, listen to me. The law came effect. I'm telling you what I know looking at my books. But the, the law. The law. The law, your books at the particular the, time, the law didn't affect you. The law no. was going to affect you the following year. The books you were on was, was Obama's books. Right, that's right. The books you were benefited from was the laws that was passed by Obama. And then the other person came in, I'm trying not to mention that. No, I'm talking about the, I'm talking about the COVID years. I'm talking about those years. So what happened is, during these years, this person was benefiting from all Obama laws, well, I wasn't and then why? I was actually talking about uh, Democratic happening but, in 1990. Right, but you asked why it was it lower during those years. I'm telling you what happened. What years was I talking about? Well, you said. I said regime. Okay, you said regime. So regime lasts for how long? Democratic versus, I didn't even say Democrats. I said Democratic versus Republicans. 
And how long does the regime last? The regime lasts four years. Four and years. They're not the only two presidents that went to prison first. Oh, I'm, I'm not Maybe disagreeing. I look at my business and my taxes overall, and I look at my money. I notice that my taxes are lower, lower with the Republican versus the Democrat. I didn't say nothing about Obama. I didn't say nothing about Harris. I said nothing about Biden. I'm talking about the regime. Well, the law didn't just came in. The law is inactive, is active at right now. Every year for the next to the next four years, your percentage go up. The well, number. this has happened all over the period of the 90s and the 2000s? No. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. No, I can't, I can't tell you that. Okay. I, I don't have, well, if I had it, if I had in front of it, but here's the other thing I would tell you. When it comes to business, most people call it tax write-offs. Accountants would tell you there's no such thing as a tax write-off. There's a such thing as a tax deduction. So there's deductions. So people go, I'm going to get a write-off. No, there's no write-off. There's deductions. So most people are not aware of all the deductions they get as a result of having a small business. There's so many things you can deduct, and that's why I think everybody should own one. Everyone should own a small business. I don't know what's going on in your, in your business situation. I can tell you I've benefited every year as a result of owning a business. So I did my tax deductions properly with myself, with my son's business, with her business, doing my tax deductions so I can reduce my tax liability. And so have no folks, so you said there's a tax law that's presently that would benefit? No, there's a tax law that's presently on the books that's going to raise your taxes up every year until yes, 2000. Okay, so now that was enacted by the other regime. That's active right now. Okay, that's what I was saying. Okay. I think another thing but it was passed by the other regime. Is that the amount of deductions have been drastically They have. So whereas, just say hypothetically, two years ago, you had 10 different things that you used for deductions. Now it's 100. You see what I'm saying? Uh, and, and that's a big part of how your business has to be in the tax arena, is that you have to have the right deductions for accounting. Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I was going to um, say, what Dr. Kim was saying, because I understand, I, I've been young in the business for about 30 years, and I've noticed this myself. When Republicans come into office, and I'm about to say it so that Kristen can't say it. <laughs> we need to get to the, make sure you have the camera pointed at her. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Point the camera that way. Yeah, Let's, go Holly's ahead. Daughter. <laughs> <laughs> not, not the Holly's daughter. <laughs> say it out loud. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Let me bring you a mic. Say it louder. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Say it. Go ahead. Say it. Well, well, let me let me help you, let me help you with that right quick. First of all, the Dow has been the highest it's ever been, ever, ever been this year. The Dow, that's the Dow Jones Act. That's the investment you're talking. About. It's been the highest it's ever been. Who's in office? Who's in office? What? Who's in office? Who's in office? Now let me back up. Let me back up. Let me back up. So it's been the highest it's ever been, ever, 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 ever. So let, let me back up for a second. So here's the thing. I did to know. My dad had 12 kids. I'm the youngest of the 12. I grew up so broke, and somebody robbed me to just be practicing. That's how broke. That's how broke I was. I was on food stamps. I, I got. I had potted milk. I had the Kellogg Corn Flakes that didn't have the sugar in it, yeah. the one with the roost on the front. 
I had the pot of milk in the box. That's what I grew up on. And then I married that lady. And I was a senior airman in the military. And we had a kid. And I was so broke. We lived payday to payday. We didn't know how to, we didn't know how to pay our bills. We didn't know how to do whatever. And then I had to go get wick, wick for her, that social support to feed my kids. And here's the thing, when a significant event woke up me that I was so happy to be able to get that, to be able to feed my, ch my children, I couldn't afford to feed them because I wouldn't make enough money as a senior airman to take care of her and my kids. And then I went to the store, I went to the store, and, I, and she sent me and said, say, go to the store and go get some wick. So I go to the store to get the wick, and I'm standing in line at the checkout line. And here's the thing, I picked up the wrong peanut butter. Yeah. And you know what they did? They stopped the whole line and said, he got the wrong peanut butter. I didn't pick up the one that said wicks on it. Yeah. And then after I got past that, she said, he picked up the wrong cereal. And here I am as a black man. I'm turning colors in the line. I was already light. I'm turning red because she's embarrassing me right now. And I called my wife and said, baby, I don't care if I have to work three jobs. I ain't going to get no milk. I ain't going to get nothing. I ain't going to get no wick. I ain't going there again. But I'm going to tell you this. I've evolved since then. If you got a WIC card and you don't want to go, I go stand in line and get your milk for you. I'll be bald. I don't care. If they hold up the line, I'm going. I'm going to get my free milk. I'm going to get my free cereal. I'm going to get my, I thank God for Jesus. I thank God for giving me those programs that helped me when the time. Now, I thank God that I ain't got to do that no more. But it was a time I did. I appreciate that boost that I got. If, you, if anybody been in that situation beside me, well, you didn't have nothing. And, and I had the food stamps with the, I had the money. I had the one you rip out. I didn't have the one, I didn't have the card you could go with that card and slide it in, like a credit card. I didn't have that. I had the paper. So, time, how old are you now? So, see, I'm 65, see, time has changed. See, now you, you, you don't have to know. They don't have to know. Nobody know you on WIC or EB. They don't know you got that. But back in their days, <laughs> they know that. They know that. And girls wouldn't date me. Here's the other thing. Girls wouldn't date me because they knew I was broke. Because I was standing in line on, on Fridays. I had to stand in line and get my free lunch card because my dad couldn't afford to buy lunch. So I had to buy lunch. So I had to stand in line and get a free lunch card. And that's why I was so hard on my granddaughter one day, my, my, my granddaughter's mother called and says, my baby ain't got no lunch, no lunch money. And she does, I, I call her, and she put that on Facebook. I call her up and I said, don't you ever post something like that on Facebook, as long as I'm her granddaddy. She will never be, want for anything. She won't ever want for clothes. She won't ever want for food. She won't ever want for shelter. And she don't even have to pay for her college, because guess who got her? Her granddad. But it was a time I couldn't do that. I told you it was a time. That's my granddad. There you go. <laughs> granddad, loan me five dollars. Let me hold something. <laughs> go ahead, Apostle. I'm sorry. Bring it back. Yes, sir. Bring it back to business. Bring it back, Apostle. You mentioned, uh, you know, for everybody to have a business. Uh, what do you recommend? Uh, LLC. I know. I know. It's, I know. It's uh, depending on the business model, depending on the tax code, and all that. My understanding is that LLC is not a tax business. Well, you got LLCs, you got LLPs, you got limited liability corporations, you got limited liability partnerships. You also have uh, S cores and you have C cores. Mm -hmm. So, if you don't, um, C cores are usually have boards like Bank of America is a C core. S core is right underneath that. So, it depends on the type of business you're starting. That's going to determine what you want. Some people are so, still sole proprietors today. And they're using their social security number. They work. But the problem is, is your liability to go with that. That's why people get LLCs versus that. So it just depends on the type of business. So it, but yeah. I understand what you're saying. Is it double tax? What's that? At a certain, the LLC is double tax. It can be. Yeah, okay. At some, so at some depends on how much money you make, and then you want to be an escort versus. Yeah. That's why your taxes, that's where your tax come from. It will come from. <laughs> so we just figured it out. Thank you, Apostle. We just figured out what was going on. We, we just figured out what was going on. Just that it wasn't. 
She had one of, she had one of those former IRS agents. <laughs> uh, it's all right, Dr. Kim. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just joking. I'm sorry. As an escort, and you do. And ask permission. You do. You have to make that kind of change and turn from LLC to incorporation and then be elected as escort. As an escort, that's correct. You have to file as escort. And the other thing people fail at, too, which I didn't mention yet, they fail at registering with the county or the city. So in some places, you got to be registered when the city and the county is an LLC or escort. So, right, so every year we register in the county. Uh, so uh, and if you have a business, you can't just use any address. You have to use a physical address. You use a physical address. They're gonna come check and see, are yep. you disturbing the, <laughs> are you disturbing the rest of the neighborhood with that with yep. that business? So, so you have to be careful. Yeah. Homeowners, so HOAs determine. They might say you can't have a business in the neighborhood. So you got to know that too. But I will tell you this. What's your name? Pamela. Pamela, if you have an EBT card, just loan it to me. I'm gonna go. <laughs> I'm, I'm leaving right after you leave. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> I'm going with Dr. Holly. Dr. Holly, don't me five dollars. Let me hold something. Let me hold something. Okay, guys, here are the best accounting softwares out there. This is according to Forbes and this is according to Nerd Wallet. This is not according to Dr. J. This is not according to me. This is what they say it is. Now, I'm going to tell you this so you know when you deal with merchant services. Y'all know what merchant service is? That's where you swipe your credit cards. Um, I work for one of the largest merchant service companies in the world. It was called, Fi it was called First da Data, and now it's Fiserv. I used to run their merchant service program. Hmm? They're the same company? Same company. So what a lot of people don't realize, companies like Stank of America, they say Stank of America Merchant Service, I mean Bank of America Merchant Service. This be recorded? I don't know. I hope it don't run. Well, Bank of America Merchant Service, they, they're a third-party vendor underneath Fiserv. Chase Merchant Service is a third-party vendor underneath Fiserv. Mm -hmm. Then WorldPay just changed the name. I can't remember who think who uh, WorldPay used to be. So you only have like four or five very large merchant service companies. Yeah, they're demonic, they're and, like a and they're located right here in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. They're located out of 400. That's where they're located. And then they sell these services to other companies, and then we buy it from the other companies, so you get that third-party cost. Oh. So when you, do when you do your merchant services, make sure you do your shopping. Because you want to shop around and make sure they're not charging you a whole lot of fees. This is your church finances software. Y'all want to tell you who my software is at the church? Let me tell you why she's my software. Let me tell you why, Dr. Kim. Well, she has, she has, a, she has two doctor's degree, first of all. But two masters, two, one doctor's, right? She's much smarter than me. So let me tell you, let me tell you, so she ain't saying nothing, but she's brilliant. She's much smarter than me. I'm just a more fortunate man to be married to her. So I told her the other day, I'm so humble enough to know I could be replaced. <laughs> what other part? And I told her, I said, I'm humble enough to know that I could be replaced, but I'm cocky enough to know that whoever she replaced me with is a downgrade. <laughs> I'm sorry, Doc. I'm sorry, Doc. I'm sorry, Doc. I'm sorry, Doc. <laughs> you knew it was a butt. <laughs> it was the rest of the story. I'm sorry, Doc. <laughs> but it's so true. But anyway, but she's, she's brilliant. Let me tell you why I found out how brilliant she was as an administrator. One day, so she has about eight, nine, I was telling the apostle, he has how many? Eight? Seven. Seven bank accounts for the, for the church. She has a youth checking account. For the youth, she had one for the men. That way we don't commingle the funds, so she keep different ones. And I was a banker, so I know how to go into the bank and talk their lingo. Mm -hmm. So any case, so one day she called me up and she says, Jay, I need you to stop by Office Depot. And I had been working all day doing something. I need you to stop by Office Depot and get some paper for the church. And you know what I do? I said, yes, ma'am. I'm on the way. I'm in front of, so I go into Office Depot, and remember, I had been working since like 5 o'clock that morning. And I go to the Office Depot, I get the paper, 
And then I, in line at Office Depot, they got candy. And I'm sitting there, I'm starving. So I pick up a candy bar, a Snickers candy bar, and I put it on that church card. And I get the phone call. Uh, Pastor, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't Jay, it was just Pastor Jay. I already knew him in trouble as soon as she's called me Pastor Jay. I already knew she was in trouble. <laughs> I used to be her pastor. <laughs> like she said, I was a Pastor Jay. Said, yep, yeah, dear, what's going on? I heard the pastor. Uh, did you just put a Snickers bar on the church card? I said, yes, ma'am. I was hungry. I was in line and I didn't have time to go get lunch. But you need to get that money back to the church. I said, what? She said, yeah, the money you got on that. I had to go back home and give her the money for the Snickers bar. She accounted for every penny. Every penny she knows. Did she say, uh? What did she say? What did she say? I didn't hear that. <laughs> okay. But anyway, these are not the only, I would tell you, I think Dr. Kim says she has a CPA. Everybody don't have CPAs, but this is software you can use. You don't like orange? What does that mean? Are they rattling? <laughs> oh, you don't like the orange. She don't like the orange. She don't want to go to jail. You don't want to go to jail. So, I have a CP. I just happen to have a CPA live across the street from me. So that was a question that I'm messing up. I, and it, she, it drives her crazy because she said, "Ain't no way he can like you." Because him and I, we fuss like cats and dogs, right? Mm. He's a CPA, and I'm a banker. They don't go hand in hand, and we fuss, and we fight, but we still friends. We go to lunch. And he called me yesterday. Where are you going to lunch at? I want to take you to lunch. So I like to go to lunch with him because he always pay. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, but anyway. Here's some of the accounting software. Merchant services, this is what Forbes and say the best merchant service companies. When you do merchant services, be careful of additional fees they charge you. I noticed you use Cash App. We use Cash App. We used to use, what did Cash App do to you? They did something to us. So who do we use at the church? We use we have Zelle. We have online giving. We have, we have like five different ways to give. We also have the old-fashioned way, write a check. Y'all remember write a check and cash? Now, here's the problem with write a check. If I go to a 32-year-old and say write a check, guess what they don't know how to do? They don't do curses. They don't know how to write a check. So I made the mistake one day when I was in class, and I said, I told the students, they were in your age bracket, I said, here's what you're going to do. You're going to fill this out. You're going to go to the bank. Then you're going to go to the bank, and you're going to mail this back. You're going to go to the post office. You're going to put a stamp on it and mail it back. And the person said, what's a post office? No. What's an envelope? What's a number 10 envelope? Everything's digital. So they don't know what a post office, they don't know what a stamp is. Y'all remember the stamp at the post office? Yeah. They, they don't know what that is. Kids don't know what that is. They don't know. If I, do everybody here know how to write a check? Yeah. Everybody here really know how to write a check. Anybody don't know how to write a check? If you don't know how to write a check, raise your hand. I don't write checks, so I'll let you know. She write all the checks. I have no idea how much money I make. She gave me a budget. First lady, you know what my budget is? I get fifty dollars a week. <laughs> and if I go with fifty dollars, guess what she do? Here's the thing: if y'all ever had an insufficient fund look on your face, <laughs> I go to Kroger's doc, and I will go into Kroger's and I try to use my card, and the person behind me say, "Sir, you ain't got no money in your account." <laughs> so I get an and then I have to call up, and then if I can't get her, guess what? I can't get what's that. And I'm like, uh, this, sorry, uh, sir, you don't have any money. <laughs> how you know I ain't got no money? I just ain't got no money in that account. But, the, but I've had that happen to me how many times? A lot. <laughs> uh, I, I am not. I got a $50 a week budget. That's my budget. 
And if I bust my budget, did I tell you I've been married to a black woman for 33 years? That's why I'm bald headed. Look at my head. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Now, here's the advantage of my family. So I'm going to tell you about my family real quick before I go to the next part. My family, my family is, is black. My family is Spanish, French, and German, and Indian. That's, that's how it makes When you go to my family reunion, you know what you're going to get. You know if you're going to get sex and speak in Spanish. You don't know you got a sex and speak in French. Or you're going to get somebody. You don't know what you're going to get when you go to my family reunion. You, you never know. But they be good. I'll be eating some good food. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Real quick. So that's the best credit card companies. If you don't know who the other credit card companies, go to Zip. Go to Yep. Just go to Yep and look them up. Watch out for the fees. If you don't know what to look for, let me know. I'll, I'll walk you through that process on Yep. Real quick, this is a question that came up real quick about sales tax exemption. Churches do not qualify for six. I hate to tell you this, we don't qualify for sales tax exemptions. But your school does, certain things does. Schools, after school programs do. Uh, this, is what, this is what the Georgia regulation says, the reason why churches don't. This just was enacted this year. I don't wanna say who by, by who, but it's enacted by somebody you like. Uh, they enacted this law that took away tax exemption from churches. So that's what happened. And that's the form you fill out. If you would go into Office Depot or you go into Staples, you were buying something, you would fill out this form, in which you get your tax exemption. Tax exemption is huge. So if you're buying something for the bookstore or something like that, I think they get tax exemption as well. Am I correct? Your bookstore does or no? No. No, they don't. Okay. But anyway. It's, it's, it depends on my state. In Texas, state of Texas, you exempt from everything. But in Georgia, they changed it. Oh, wow. That was done by a governor. I don't want to say which one. He's a friend of mine, so I don't want to say which one. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Did I say this year? Did I say that? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. So anyway, nonprofits, pers personal financial statements, nuns, number, religious organization, questionnaire, nonprofit, Financial software, sales exemption status, those are things we talked about. I uh, also teach financial literacy. We teach at, she teaches with me, we teach at, um, we were just in Newnan, Georgia. We were in Meta in Covington. We travel the world. We get a chance to teach financial literacy. People hate when we come and teach financial literacy because it'd be so real. They want to shut, they want to shut us down from teaching. We, we don't teach people how to save money. We teach you how to keep your money. And also, we teach you not to live like we did when we grew up. We grew up, we were both. So a little history about Lady Tina. Lady Tina, when she was 17, she went to the University of Oklahoma. That's where she graduated from. She lived in the airport. Like, you know, the airport. And she puts a little bucket around to get the quarterback so she gets something to eat. I lived in my car, a 69 Volkswagen. Because my dad, when I turned 17, he said, you're 17, you graduate high school, get out. I had 12 kids. He'd get rid of them out. So I joined the military. I joined the Air Force. I did 20 years in the Air Force. And then that woman made me go to school. She said, you're going to be married to me? You need to go get a degree. She was supposed to marry a, a pro football player. He was, make, he was a millionaire. But she, but she upgraded. She got me. <laughs> so what happened was, the, the real answer, I came into life, made a jacket, I just moved ahead, direction clear, made, became a reason for living. I became a heart, a soul, a strong inspiration. Oh, <laughs> that's what happened. That's what happened. But, but that's how it happened. So we came from nothing to God blessing us. So nothing we have wasn't the result of what God did for us. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Amen. Nothing we got or we do. During COVID, and I'm going to get ready to shut up. During COVID. Everybody around us was getting sick. She and I, we were going to nursing homes. We were still doing funerals. We were still doing everything. We didn't catch a cold. Amen. Amen. Praise God. The feathers was covered. Our whole family was covered. Thank you, 
And we were doing everything that God told us. She knows she was sitting there. I said, why would you go out? And that's COVID. You're still going out and you're still going praying for these people. I was still doing it. Now, I'm going to tell you something else. Everybody we was touched with finance have been blessed over and over. If they touch me. Look at this man right here. And he might not say it. He might not say it, but here's what happened. When he came to Holistic Life Church, when he came to visit us, he was struggling financially. And I told him, come rub my shoulders. And what happened? What happened? Tell me what happened. Household, pay off all your debt. And now he don't have to work. He don't want to. That's how God blessed him. And that happens over and over and over again. And not because of Jay, because of God. God continued to bless. Think of Pastor. Think of Think of Think of Hey, hey, I love it. I love it. Hey, hey, hey. In the name of Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. In the name of Jesus. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. In the name. In the name of Jesus, touch her. There you go. <laughs> In the name of Jesus, you go. <laughs> Thank y'all for having me. I appreciate it. I hope y'all learned something from this. Any, uh, any questions, real quick? Any questions? I'm sorry. There's a question over here. Yes, ma'am. You got 501, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So you got 29 different 501s. Could be the same. Could be the same 501. Now, I want to tell y'all you got to be smarter than the average bear when you do stuff. So I know you listen to like Fox News and I get that. So, but here's the thing. And I got to shut up because Pastor told me, you know. So recently I had to go with a young man who's in the Navy. He was in the Navy Army. I had to go with him to watch to North Carolina. And his car got towed away in North Carolina. And he called me and said, Pastor Jay, can you go with me to North Carolina? I said, yeah. So we go up to North Carolina. We go into the mountains of North Carolina. Have anybody ever been to the mountains of North Carolina? You know what you see in the mountains? You know what you see? You see flags. You see, you see all kinds of stuff. If I didn't know I was a person of color then, I knew I was a person of color there. So when I got out there, so we pull up to go get his car. His car got towed away. We pull up, and he said, what are you going to do? You see this place you at? I said, watch this. So I, first thing I did, I put on my, where's my hat at? No, I put on my hat. Because you know what I put on my hat? Because I was no longer a black man. I was a veteran. So I put on my hat. And the guy came out chewing tobacco. He said, hey, how you doing? I said, I'm doing great, sir. How you doing? What do you think about that election? I said, I love the election. Some people make some great decisions. He said, love the hat you got on. I said, yeah, I did 20 years in the Air Force. He said, thank you so much for your service. I said, I love that gun you got on your side. He said, you want to see another one? I said, yes, sir. So he goes inside. He goes inside. He goes get another gun. He comes out. He uncocks it. He gives it to me. He said, take a look at this. I just built this for my wife. I said, I'm going to build one for my wife when I get home. How much can I buy this for? He said, you can't buy this. He said, but I'll help you build it if you want to. I said, thank you, sir. I said, I love your flags. Your flags are awesome. He said, great. And the guy, his name was Will, he said, how did you do that? I said, when you roam, you do what Romans do. I want to fuss that man in North Carolina. I'm trying to get you a car. He said, I'm going to give you half off the price of getting that car out, too. I said, thank you, sir. I salute you for your service. Thank you for serving the Army for two days. 
Your, tw- <laughs> your 48 hours count. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> but anyway, any final questions? I really appreciate y'all having me. I love, I, here's the thing, I love the church. I love, love this man. I love this man. This man took me in a long time ago. I don't know why. I don't know why he, he I don't know why he want to take me in. Yes, ma'am. What about what about grants? There's no really a lot of true grant writers out there. Yeah, they, I, I, name is a fraud. <laughs> well, they go to grant school, but they don't. Now, here's the thing about grants: when you get a grant, watch what you're asking for, because what happens yeah. is you're subject to inspections, you're subject yeah. to all yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. When you decide to get a grant, and you decide. That's what you want to do. That's better ways to get money than grants sometimes. Yeah. There's okay. other ways. There's, there's what you call angel investors. Mm-hmm. There's the other people that will give you money to help you if they believe in you. Right. You got to create the belief that they believe in you. Then they believe in what you could do. So if they believe in what you can do, um, one of the things that happened, and I'm going to go give this to Apostle, during COVID, um, a lot of churches were shutting down. Y'all probably remember during COVID. Yeah. A lot of church was sitting down, and this is why my 27-year-old, who, he wasn't 27 at the time, he was a, a star football player at Kennesaw State, but he's also an influencer. And he had nine million, he still had nine million followers. And during COVID, every life people were struggling, and he went to his followers and says, I believe my dad's a pastor. I need you to believe in me. If you believe in me, donate 25 cents to my dad's church. I think it was 25 or 50 cents. I can't remember what it was. Can you imagine 9 million people donate 25 cents? What happens? Somebody do the math. What's 25 cents times 9 million? So we never had to worry because we were blessed exceedingly abundantly what we ask for and think according to the power that worked with us. That's how beautiful my God is. That's how beautiful your God is. And guess what? He not only bless, bless you physically, but mentally and financially. If I can do it, and I was poor, I was poor, if I can do it, you can do it. And if you're ever in Kennesaw, come say hi to us. Don't leave Sebastian, though. Don't leave, don't leave my apostle. The apostle, he's amazing. He's taught me some things that he only know he taught me. He taught me, he teach me, he listened to me when I whined to him. So I greatly appreciate him being my big brother. So thank you so much. Amen. Good job, man. Good job. Yeah, I'll give him one more hand.